Bonjour, good afternoon, buenas tardes, buenas eh, benvenuti, welcome. And this is the third panel of the of the first day of, of conferences here in, in Paris. And we are in the third room. And we have, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. J, Dr. Jason William, who grew up in California and Montana, but now calls Virginia home. And uh, he's an independent scholar of Freemasonry and the author of this marvelous book that I have here with me, Brought to Light, The Mysterious George Wands Masonic Cave. But today he will talk about also about George Washington, but a different topic today. Dr. Williams will talk about Washington's Masonic Cave and Lafayette's Masonic Apron. What's the connection? And I'll thank you, Dr. Williams, who's coming from Virginia. So, and thank you for coming, and if you have any questions or if something I say is not understood, just let me know. It's a very informal talk. So you can see, uh, it's going to be a very visual talk too. So you're going to want to look at the screen, not me. So, um, the title of my book is Brought to Light, which is, I believe, I'm not a Freemason. Um, and, uh, but I understand that that's a Masonic saying, if somebody is brought to light. We're going to be looking at George Washington and the Marquis de Lafayette, two very important men uh, who are very important in freedom and democracy in, the, in, the, in being established in the world. Um, on the left is George Washington, about five years before he died, wearing his uh, um, jewel, pa uh, uh, past master jewel. And on the right is Lafayette in a Continental Army uniform because he fought for the Americans, with the Americans in, during the Revolution. Um, and I had heard about this Masonic cave in the state of West Virginia in the United States. A friend told me about it and I had never heard about it in any history books, so I wondered what is it? It's like a local legend, a local uh, rumor that there's a cave that George Washington used when he was young as a Freemason. And I was wondering, can this be true or is it just a hoax, somebody just playing a joke? Um, and then I also, in the process, learned a lot more about Lafayette's Masonic apron, and I want to um, show how these two things are connected today. So, um, and George Washington was also fond of this saying, brought to light, um, and he said, truth will ultimately prevail where pains is taken to bring it to light. And this topic has been a labor of love for me. I'm still doing research, trying to understand how much of this cave is true history, and how much is just a fabrication and a legend. And so this is, this is a, a, one of my main missions in life, is not just being a doctor now, but researching this cave and George Washington and Lafayette too. Uh, hmm. There we go. So the story starts in 1748. George Washington was only 16 years old and he went to the frontier of the colony of Virginia. It wasn't the United States yet. He was a student surveyor, and he went over the Blue Ridge Mountains and into the Shenandoah Valley, what is today West Virginia. Back then, this was still in the colony of Virginia. He was still loyal to the British crown. And the legend says he entered this cave and he carved his signature and the year on the back wall, and then he left. That's what the legend says. Could it be true? So on the left, you will see uh, this is an actual George Washington GW, you can see in the bottom. This is a survey he made when he was 16 years old of his brother's farm. On the top right, those are George Washington's surveying equipment that he used because he was a surveyor long before he was a politician or a general. And in the bottom right is where George Washington would stay, a little wood shack. When he was on the frontier, he would stay in there and go do his surveying. This is the Chesapeake Bay. This is the Potomac River. Washington, D.C. is right here. Mount Vernon, which was George Washington's home for most of his adult life, later in life, is here in, in Virginia. The cave is where the X is over in the frontier, across the mountains and in the valley along the Shenandoah River. Uh, George Washington, he was born in this part of Virginia, he grew up in Fredericksburg, and that's where he became a Freemason too, was in Fredericksburg. So the cave is up here, 
um, quite, a, quite a, uh, a distance away from uh, where late, most people know of George Washington. So this is the state of West Virginia, and at the very tip is this county called Jefferson County. And this is Jefferson County. Charlestown is named after George Washington's young, younger brother, Charles Washington. He founded that town, but not until the 1780s. We're talking much earlier than that. The cave is just a little south of Charlestown. We'll also be talking about another town called Shepherdstown. Both of these are in the same county. This county is more famous for Harper's Ferry, is where John Brown, if you know American history, is a very famous place. But we're going to be talking about Charlestown and Shepherdstown. Next, please. So this is my friend Scott and myself. This is the day we decided we wanted to go into the cave to see if we can find this carved signature. I could not find any photographs of anybody who ever took a picture of it. So I said, I want to go take a picture. So we went there, and as you get closer, you can see like a little dip or sink. And next slide. And then when you come to the entrance, you see all of these doors that have been torn off, an old sofa, and old brick walls. And apparently, they say George Washington went in there when he was 16. And later, again, next slide. So we looked around, there's a lot of garbage everywhere. It's very sad. It's in a, you know, if it's true that George Washington used this as a Masonic temple, this is very, very sad. This should be a treasured place in, a, in the United States history. And we found like drug needles and things like that in here. It's very sad. We looked all over in the main room. We could not find the signature after a couple hours. Next slide. Um, but we saw a lot of carvings from Freemasons over many years who come back and sign their name and their lodge number, and sometimes they have some interesting designs. I have a website, later you can go look at more. Finally, we decided we'll go down one passage. It was full of water about up to here, so we decided to go through this passage. Next slide. That's my buddy Scott going down this long. Next, please. And finally, we found it deep in, in there. And it's hard to see, and it, you have to take two pictures because the wall is curved, it's not flat. So, so G, W, and then it says Washington, and it says 1748. So um, we took these pictures, and then I wanted to, after we left, I wanted to find out, is this real? Is it possible? Next slide, please. So George Washington did travel to write this in this area in 1747 slash eight. 1748 is, um, what was the, is what we still use, the Gregorian calendar. 1747 is the Julian calendar. And this is the cover of his journal. And on the cover he says 1747, which doesn't match inside the cave, it says 1748 but a lot of times people would use both or sometimes switch back and forth. And even in Washington's journal, one day he would write 1748, the next day he would write 1747. So maybe, is, maybe it is true, the signature. Um, he went into the, um, on this journal, he went with his best friend, a next door neighbor named George Fairfax. And, uh, the, from what we can read in the journal, they went to at least within seven miles of the cave. And that would, they were on horses, so within a couple hours at the most, they could have easily gone to the cave. He doesn't write about the cave in the journal, but they were right there in that year. Um, interestingly, George Washington's papers, his letters, his journals, his documents, a lot of them got destroyed and lost after he died. And it wasn't until much later that they were able to group them together. And it wasn't until 1889 that George Washington's papers were first published. But what we see is this book right here, A History of the Valley of Virginia, has a short entry. And this book is from 1830, already saying this cave and signature is a legend in the local area. So if somebody went into the cave as a joke, how did they know in, it, so long before even Washington's papers came out that he was there that year? Unless it was Washington or a very, very close friend who did this joke. 
Uh, and from, my, from looking inside the cave, the, besides the George Washington signature of all the Freemasons who came to visit, 1801 is the earliest that I could find and take a picture, 1801. Next slide, please. So two years later, 1750, he went into the cave in 1748, is what we believe. In 1750, George Washington started surveying the land right around the cave. For, this is Lord Fairfax. He is, was one of the richest men in all of American colonies back then. He was the only nobleman from England to live in America. Everybody else stayed back in England. He actually came and lived on the frontier, and he hired George Washington to be his surveyor. And this is George Fairfax, who is a nephew of Lord Fairfax. Um, and so this right here is what they call the cave farm. And the cave is right on the top of it. It turns out that George Washington did the survey for the cave farm and the land right around the cave. So, and this land was owned by George Fairfax. Okay, the same person he went on this journey with in 1748. So this land was surveyed in 1750 by George Washington, but the land right next to it, which they, they combined together, was surveyed in 1747, the same year or the year before when they went into the cave. So it makes perfect sense that, hey, he just bought this land, that they should go look at the land, and then there's the cave, and they went inside. So that it, it all, all the pieces fit together. Um, there was also very early iron forges uh, in operation iron, process iron. And there's even still a very old house right here, right across uh, from the cave, uh, where somebody, we don't know who, but it was probably being lived in a long, long time ago. There's still somebody living in this very old home. Nobody knows the history of it. Now, the Fairfax family was involved in Freemasonry since at least 1705. And in fact, they, the Fairfax family was very much involved in the English Civil War in the 1600s as well. Um, so we know that all of the Fairfaxes were Freemasons and they were very prominent in Freemasonry. Next slide. Also in 1750, George Washington started buying pieces of land right along, around the cave and he put together his first farm. It was his first home. And he put together 2,000 acres, and he called it the Bullskin, or sometimes he called it my mountain quarters, even though it was in the valley. Mostly he grew tobacco there, later he added corn and some other crops, and he had slaves that he had inherited there. His older brother was still living at Mount Vernon, which is where we usually think of George Washington. Later he inherited Mount Vernon, but he first had his Bullskin. Um, and what had happened is so many years of farming in, in uh, this, in the, the old part of Virginia, the soil was depleted. And so they need to find new soil to plant crops. And so the new farm is what allowed George Washington to live a nice, rich life. It was, he didn't stay so much there, but that's where he made his money, okay? But like I said, it would be another 20 years until Charlestown, was established right where the cave is by his younger brother. And um, he continued to operate his bullskin farm until 1799 when he died. Next slide, please. In 1752, at age 20, George Washington joined the fraternity, the craft. And he entered at Fredericksburg in Virginia. And it was mostly Scottish immigrants. And the important thing to realize is this lodge that George Washington joined did not have a charter, not until year, some years later. So it would have been very accustomed to, to George Washington to be associated with a Masonic lodge that was independent. Maybe now it would be called rogue or clandestine or something, but back then this was kind of normal. It wasn't a mandatory. Um, and then in 1753 he was passed to the second degree uh, and then eventually Master Mason. Interestingly, the same lodge in 1753 had the world's first uh, conferral of the Royal Arch degree, was in George Washington's lodge. In fact, it was the man who um, made George Washington a Mason, the, the worshipful master, 
he was the one who got the first Royal Arts degree. There's no evidence George Washington ever got that degree, but one of his aprons has this on it. So maybe, maybe, next slide. Two years, so George Washington did not stay very active in his local lodge for long because a war started and it was called the French and Indian War or the Seven Years War. In fact, it was nine years. They still call it the Seven Years War, but it lasted nine years. Um, and George Washington basically is the guy who started the war. You may have heard about this. He, for necessity, he attacked, he joined the, the military, he attacked the, the French, and uh, it basically started war in America, um, and then eventually the rest of the world. He was stationed at Winchester, which was about 16 miles from the cave. I'll show you a map in a second. And he did not like Winchester. He called it a vile place. It was a frontier town. It was very, probably very, not a very happy place to live. It's, we, um, it's pretty much accepted that there were Masonic lodges during the French and Indian War. We just don't have any records to know where or what they did. Um, but what we do know is that George Washington was already a Freemason. All of his, the soldiers that served under him and his closest associates, most of them were all Freemasons, many of them Scottish. And we see letters that Washington sends back to his home lodge in Fredericksburg, still communicating with his Masonic brothers while he's out on the frontier. So we have to assume there was a lodge somewhere out on the frontier. We just don't know where. Um, but keep in mind that the K farm owner was George Fairfax, and he was also in charge of the county militia. So the same person who owns the K farm and the cave is in charge of the militia and is a Freemason, and you know, all of this, the pieces like all fit together. Um, George Washington served in the military from 1754 until 1759. Uh, and then he went to live uh, at, at Mount Vernon and started his next career as a politician. He transitioned away from being a soldier and into being a politician. But during those years from 54 to 59, he was mostly out on the frontier in Winchester, very close to the Cape. Next slide. So American history books sort of generalize and they show this is Alexandria close to where his Mount Vernon is. And they, they give these maps of the French and Indian War showing that they, the path they took to fight the French went through Winchester, which is where his headquarters was, and then further north into the Ohio River to fight the French. But it's not exactly how it happened. Next slide. A more detailed is, they, this is what is now Charlestown. And they actually went through and right by Charlestown, two miles away from where the cave was. So not only was George Washington out close by, but the actual military procession of probably where these, of mostly Freemasons, went right by this cave. And in fact, it was, a, it was, a, it was like a traveling city. It was like 2,400 soldiers on one of the expeditions, lots of cannon and heavy artillery. They had to like make a, a road to get up in, uh, through the frontier. So this took quite a bit of time. And basically they camped out on land that belonged to George Washington's brother, also right there at Charlestown. So it makes sense that this would be a great place to have a lodge um, if it was the Cape. Next slide. Winchester didn't have a lodge until 1760 after the war was over. Right, so finally, uh, in, in 1760, an unchartered lodge came up in, Win in Winchester. It wasn't until 1768 that the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania issued a charter to Winchester. But during the French and Indian War, there were no known lodges. But where were these Freemasons meeting out on the frontier back then? Um, and what we see is that, if, you know, if you read through my book, you'll see many ties between the Winchester Lodge and the people who were living right around the cave and who worked alongside George Washington. Next slide. Now, um, I, a, lot of the, a lot of the evidence in my book is circumstantial, but this is not. This is direct primary evidence. So George Washington wrote a letter about this cave. 
right? So in 1761, um, well, this gentleman, Andrew Barnaby, came to the United States to take a tour of the U.S. colonies. This is before the Revolution. Went back to England, but along the way, he stopped over twice at Mount Vernon and stayed with George Washington. And after he returned to England, he wrote a letter back to Washington saying, you remember that cave you told me about? I'm really curious about it. I want to get some more details. And actually, he didn't, um, he called it a well. And, but George Washington, uh, in a letter in return, next slide, says, um, you must in some measure, sir, have misunderstood my account of the cavern near Winchester, where I greatly exaggerated the circumstances in giving a relation of it. True that it is within 16 miles of Winchester to the northeast hand of it in a plain flat country, a person may go down into a depth of 100 to 150 yards. At other times, the water rises to the top and flows plentifully, but I never ob observed any regular flux or reflux. I always concluded that the dry and wet seasons was the sole and only occasion of these changes. However, it lies within two miles of my plantation. I went back several times, oh, no, uh, um, not quite yet. Um, I went back several times to the cave. And one time when I went back, the water was completely flooded up. Um, and we couldn't get back into that tunnel to see the signature. So it's very clear his description of how this cave floods up with water and how large it is. And next slide. The fact that he gives us two measurements or vectors. One is 16 miles from his headquarters to the cave. It's exactly 16 miles. And it's also to be within two miles of his farm would have had, it's the only cave that meets both of those. So this is definitely the cave that Washington wrote about. So, and in order for Washington to have said, you know, made those observations, that means he had been in the cave multiple times to observe that the water would come and down. So this cave was something important to him. He doesn't say that there were any Masonic, you know, gatherings or anything, but something was going on. Remember, there was no town there. And this is not a cave that could be used for storage. It's too wet. Next line. <clears throat> Then, in 1773, now we're like jumping forward another 10 years, about two years before the American Revolution, two of George Washington's full brothers, that's Samuel and John Augustine Washington, plus seven other men got together. All of these men had been associated with George Washington during the French and Indian War, and they purchased the cave for $9, nine men. And that means they each got, it was, total was one and an eighth acres. Everybody purchased one eighth of an acre, acre share. So a very small piece of land, just the cave was carved out. And these men went on to become significant instigators in the American Revolution. Next slide. Now, this is what's called the Lexington Alarm Letter. This is in the Scottish Rite Museum in Lexington, Massachusetts. And so, um, the battles of Lexington and Concord basically kicked off the American Revolutionary War. It wasn't an official war yet, but it, it was the first engagement. Um, and this letter was sent all over the U.S. colonies through what were called the Committees of Safety, which were largely filled with Freemasons. Now, there's been a long debate for a long time about whether Freemasonry was the main instigator of the American and the French uh, wars for independence. But that's really not, most historians don't think it was. But what is true is that Freemasons were sort of connected through these committees, and these letters quickly were able to spread through the colonies, and it's almost like dominoes that were all lined up, ready to go, basically. Um, so on May 10th, that was on April 19th, 1775. May 10th, the men from right around the cave start grouping together and drilling, because they know they're about to be called up. June 14th, the Continental Congress in Philadelphia called for 10 companies of expert riflemen uh, from, the, uh, from three of the colonies, uh, from the county uh, militias. And the next day, George Washington was appointed the general of the whole army. And Washington went to Boston, where the English had hungered down and taken control of the harbor. And it was seen as a very crucial harbor. And uh, that's where sort of the, the Americans wanted to get a, a stranglehold on the British, but they were finding it very difficult to do. So it was called the siege, like a stalemate. And what Washington found is when he got there is that 
The militiamen in the north were not well trained. They didn't have very good military equipment. And uh, he was very concerned. Next slide. So he called up and he personally recruited the leaders of these two companies of Virginia riflemen. This is kind of what they probably looked like. They used long rifles, which the British didn't have. They could, could shoot much further and much straighter. And these are the same men who had fought with Washington during the French and Indian War. And these men had been conditioned in, you know, living in rural Virginia. That's how they fed their families, was shooting these. And so they were very sharp shooters. And um, one of the, one of the um, groups of one of the, the um, uh, companies came from Winchester, and the other came from right where the cave is. And the leader, Captain Stevenson, led 98 backcountry Virginians with military ex uh, experience. And he lived right next to the cave. Okay? And they carried these flags that say, don't tread on me. And some of them had words on their, sh on their uh, shirt that said, liberty or death. Those were the famous words of Patrick Henry. Um, uh, and, uh, and they dressed in, in these you know, buckskin shirts and, and leather leggings. And they painted their faces like Indians. And they used tomahawks and scalping knives and long rifles. This would have been really scary for the British, especially with their shooting abilities with these rifles. Next slide. And went, so this beeline march is what the historians called it. They traveled all the way from Jefferson County, right next to the cave, all the way up to Boston. And this, is a, this depiction shows George Washington greeting them on the horse. There's one of them. The reality is, in one of the journals, Washington leapt off his horse and ran up to these mountain men, really, and greeted all of them with hugs and tears were flowing down his cheeks. And George Washington was normally a very stoic man, very reserved, very stoic. This is one of the few times where we see that Washington was overwhelmed with joy because he knew now that they had an actual fighting chance with these men, the men who had fought with him during the French and Indian War. It wasn't until 1988 that Captain Stevenson's rallying point where these men grouped together, it was designated by the US Army as the birthplace of the United States Army. And these are the same Freemasons that were operating out of the Masonic cave. Next slide. So this is General John Bull, and he was not a Virginian. He was from Philadelphia, and he, along with other generals and other officers and even some French um, individuals, were visiting the cave. We know this because there's a journal from a lady who, um, she, and we'll see them on the next slide. She and her husband were staying at the cave. And this General John Bull was a top-ranking Freemason. In fact, not only had served with GW in the French and Indian War, but he was the master of Lodge Number 8 at Valley Forge. It's the same lodge where it's kind of assumed that Lafayette was made an American Mason. Um, and it was this man who actually nominated Washington to be the General Grand Master of the United States. There is no such thing. We know that each state has its own Grand Lodge. But right during the Revolutionary War, there was this plan to have a national lodge, and this is the guy who actually nominated Washington to be the, the Grand Master of America. Now, during the war, he came and purchased these two pieces of land that were owned by Stevenson, the same guy that led the Beeline March. That's the cave, this is the cave farm. And so, and what we see is documents that he's leasing out the cave to his associates during the Revolutionary War. Um, and he was going back and forth between the frontier, where there was no war out in the, out in the frontier, and Philadelphia, and organizing, help shuttle money and, and my, my hypothesis is that this was a safe and secure location where the generals could retreat from even national publicity and just talk amongst themselves, including perhaps in the lodge. Uh, next slide. And it's this lady, Sarah Norris, who kept a diary, who mentions that they leased the cave from General John Bull, um, and she describes other visitors as well. And their family was very prominent. In fact, their son, James, was the treasurer of the United States for 40 years, through the Revolutionary War and the first six presidential administrations. He was the person in charge of the national you know, you know, um, budget. <laughs> um, next slide. 
what we see is after the Revolutionary War, George Fairfax died. The, the, the Fairfax that went with Washington when they were teenagers, he died, and, and his nephew inherited it because George Fairfax didn't have um, any children of his own. So Ferdinando Fairfax, the nephew, inherited the cave, and he went to live on the cave farm or the Shannon Hill estate is what it, he um, started to call it. He was a member of the Williamsburg Lodge. Williamsburg was the capital of Virginia at the time. And he was very much involved with Masonic rites of George Washington's funeral. And his brother-in-law was the first Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Virginia. George Washington was offered it, but in 1777, Washington was very busy. He was still in the middle of the war, so he couldn't, couldn't be the first Grand Master. And in 1799, his, Ferdinando's last will and testament provided money to the Freemasons of Charlestown. But there still was no lodge in Charlestown, none that we know of. All of the other towns around it had lodges by then, but this town didn't. My theory is the cave was probably still being used for a Masonic lodge. Um, and he also called for the cave farm to go to the son of George Washington's pastor back in Alexandria, the same church where the Freemasons in, in George Washington's uh, mother lodge, they all went to that same church. So it was very closely affiliated. Next slide, please. So in, what, interestingly, what happened is this Frenchman named James Robardet, um, who was a dance teacher in Philadelphia and taught dance lessons to George Washington's step-grandchildren in the White House of the time, the presidential palace. And there are also records that he was a Freemason involved with the Grand Lodge of New York. And what happened is George Washington in 1792 wrote a very nice letter of recommendation saying he's a great dance teacher, teacher please in, welcome him down in Virginia. And what happened is Robardet actually settled right at the cave. This is an 1809 map. We see that his name is on the map right where the cave is. So a very close relationship with Washington. And 10 years later, his name is still there. Um, so it's very peculiar, um, but we know that most of Washington's family, or a lot of them, were in this area. So it makes sense that he settled there. Um, why a dance master would be living at a cave two miles outside of a tiny town that was, I'm not sure, but it's still, it's almost like he was a guardian of the cave or something like that. Then in 1824, a man named Willoughby Washington Lane, who I, in, in my book, uh, I call him the forgotten godson of George Washington. George Washington had several godsons, all of them Freemasons. This one has been totally forgotten by historians. Um, he, his great-grandfather is who George Washington was named after. Um, George Washington Eskridge was his great-grandfather. And anyway, he went on to buy the cave farm in the 1820s. And it turns out that the, uh, uh, one of my conclusions you'll see on the last slide is all of these t families are very tightly intertwined and interconnected, interlaced. So this godson of George Washington um, married a man named Andrew Kennedy. Andrew Kennedy, uh, not married a man, married a, um, the daughter of a man named An Andrew Kennedy. And Andrew Kennedy's uncle, also named Andrew Kennedy, actually owned the, the presidential palace in Philadelphia while George Washington was president. That's how prominent these people were, the people who purchased the cave and lived at the cave and handed it down in their family. They owned the White House at the time. Maybe just a coincidence, next slide. In 1864, we have a, an artist named James Taylor. He was embedded in the Union Army during the Civil War, and he was traveling around the Shenandoah Valley, taking little sketches and writing little passages about what he was seeing during the Civil War. And he heard about the Masonic Cave of George Washington. He stopped by, and he found that there was a farmer, Farmer Selden, living and farming, a, and he said, hey, Farmer Selden, can I have a light? I want to go into, your, into this cave and see the George Washington signature. And, but Farmer Selden was really busy. There were soldiers who were like running off with his hogs and who were stealing his grain. And he said, here's the light. You can go take a look yourself. I don't have time. So anyway, this artist went in. 
he drew the cave. This is how it looked back then. No sofas in this time, right? <laughs> um, and an, an, a, a little image of the inside looking and, and falling and almost slipping inside the cave. Um, and so it was documented here briefly one time. Next slide. But who are the Seldons? This farmer Selden who was at the cave and how did he get to be there? Why was he in charge by the Civil War time? The, Sel the Seldons were a very distinguished family. George Washington had been involved with their family you know, throughout the 1700s. The Selden we are gonna focus on, Wilson Carey Selden was the farmer of, father, of, of Farmer Selden. So the guy who was farming the cave farm during the Civil War, his father served in the Revolutionary War as a surgeon and in the 1780s, his crops and George Washington crops were treated almost as the same. Like the, the, the managers would combine their crops, bring them to the market and sell them together. So his son was actually living and farming the cave farm by the time the Civil War came about. And his twin sister was married to James McClurg, who was a very prominent surgeon and Freemason in America as well. Next slide. And the farmer Selden also married the granddaughter of that forgotten godson, Willoughby Washington Lane. And her name was Nellie. And what we see is she married this man, John Augustine Washington. He was the last of Washington to own and live at, the, at Mount Vernon in Alexandria. And she would go to the Kay farm and write letters from the cave farm and send them back to Mount Vernon. So, and I found these in the Mount Vernon archives. Nobody at Mount Vernon even knew what the cave farm was. Um, so next slide. And so this is George Washington's crypt right here at Mount Vernon. And there's a big marker right in front of it in memory of John Augustine Washington and Eleanor Love Selden, whose uncle was living at the cave farm right, and writing letters. So these families are so tightly connected. And we even see that this is the tombstone of the, great, of the granddaughter of Willoughby Washington Lane, who purchased the cave farm. And it was so important to them, even on their tombstone, tombstone they say she was born at the cave. It was like a really important place for this family. And we see even their children. They named um, one of their children they're one of their sons, Lawrence Washington. We see, see that they were still Freemasons, and, and it was his family that came to own and, and take care of the cave in the late 1800s. So all of these pieces not only fit, they fit really tightly. Next. Now we come to the Lafayette apron. Next. Really quickly, the Marquis de Lafayette was one of the wealthiest men in France. Uh, he became a Freemason in 1775. Um, at the Lodge of St. Jean de la Candour, and those records are downstairs in this building here. Um, and then he was at a dinner party in 1775, and he heard about George Washington starting a war um, by this man named Gloucester, or Gloucester. And Gloucester was the younger brother of King George of England. This is the very same person that, war, that Washington was starting a war against. Um, he had been sort of rejected by the king's family because he had married an illegitimate child of somebody. And um, anyway, he had, had been a gra uh, past grandmaster of the premier Grand Lodge of England, uh, Gloucester had been. And that's how Lafayette heard about this. And he decided then and there, I'm gonna go to America and I'm gonna help Washington. And so he came to the US at only age 17 as a volunteer. Washington had a lot of volunteers from France already come over and was not very pleased with them. But in Lafayette, he found something very different. Lafayette felt, fought in eight battles in a, in a very noble and you know, paid his own way and was right in the middle of the battle. He wasn't there for glory. He was there to really help out. And he basically became George Washington's adopted son. Washington never had any children, um, but he considered him his son. Uh, in fact, when Lafayette was shot through the leg in one of the battles, Washington told his personal surgeon, treat him as if he's my own son. Um, and eventually Lafayette had a huge role in getting the King of France to pony up money to help the Americans and, and, and troops and ships to help the Americans uh, win the war uh, at the Battle of Yorktown. 
And in, in, uh, as a not very touching tribute, he named his children George Washington and Virginie, that's the, the French of Virginia, be, in, in honor of George Washington, which is a real break from how French usually name, noblemen of French usually have very long names that are very passed down through the family. The Marquis wanted to name his children after George Washington. Next slide. Can we go back a slide? Yeah, next slide. So after the war, right after the war, Lafayette sent a letter to Washington saying, I want to use your name to help end slavery. Let's purchase a farm and release all the slaves, a plantation and release all the slaves. And George Washington replied back, he said, I would be happy to join you in that. So there's this kind of idea right now that George Washington was a bad slave owner. But here we see these two men of freedom talking about let's start abolition now in the 1700s, long before it ever happened the next century. Next paragraph. In 1784, Lafayette came back to America and spent a four-month tour traveling through the U.S., spoke at Congress and some other government uh, uh, meetings and helped broker a peace settlement. And finally, he went to Mount Vernon at the end of his four-month tour to visit George Washington. Next slide. And he wrote back to his wife in France, and he said, I'm not just turning a phrase when I assure you that in retirement, General Washington is even greater than he was during the Revolution. Next slide. And he brought with him this, right? It's a Masonic apron as a gift, right? It was embroidered by the Marquis' wife, and it has silver and gold wrapped threads and sequins on it. It has multiple Masonic insignias. We see the square and compasses there, right? And we see skull and crossbones with a sword, and we see uh, 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 festoons and um, a gavel. And then we also see an American flag and a French bourbon flag. And this is a gift that he brought to George Washington from France. Uh, it turned out to be his last time seeing George Washington in person. Next slide. Um, Lafayette went back to France and he ended up um, writing, uh, well, he ended up actually purchasing a colony in South America and started releasing the slaves right before the French Revolution began and wrote back to Washington and told him, look, I'm actually doing it. Um, and then he was elected to France's National Assembly and he authored, the Marquis de Lafayette authored the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. It was ratified four months before America's Bill of Rights. So it was really avant-garde, very leading um, in terms of freedom. And then he sent George Washington the key to the Bastille prison. Next slide. Washington died in 1799. Uh, he got sick. He died from asphyxiation. He couldn't breathe. His airway was inflamed. The only kind of treatment they knew how to give him was uh, bloodletting, trying to take his blood out, which only really killed him. Um, the doctor who was at his bedside, Elisha Dick, was actually the worshipful master at Washington's home lodge in Alexandria, now lodge number 22. Um, and when Washington died, he cut the the strings behind the clock and set the time, and that, that clock is now at the um, Washington uh, Memorial in Alexandria. And then Washington's body, if several days later, was placed inside a casket, mahogany casket, with one of his swords and one of his Masonic aprons, but not the one that Lafayette gave him. Next slide. So there are actually two French aprons that look very similar. This is the one that Lafayette gave to George Washington. And this is another one. You see not only the size and the shape and the fringes, even some of the themes and the colors could be easily confused between the two. Next slide. The one, the one on the left is called the Watson Casul apron. And it was presented to George Washington in 1782, um, so that two years before Lafayette gave him his gift. Um, and these were two men that helped pass, they were like spies, that passed secrets for uh, Washington and it was made by some French nuns in Nantes. And its central motif, however, instead of a skull and crossbones, it's a golden plate inscribed with a tetragrammaton and surrounded by stars and angels. And it's also held in lodge number 22, the Washington Memorial in Alexandria. Next slide. 
And then um, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania started claiming that they had the real Lafayette apron. And this is what they thought was the Lafayette apron. And the Freemasons in Alexandria said, no, we have it. We think this is the Lafayette apron. And everybody was getting confused. It's kind of important because it's believed that Washington, whichever one is the real Lafayette wash, uh, apron, was the one that Washington wore when he set the cornerstone for the, for the um, uh, Capitol building. So the very founding of democracy in the United States, if not the world. Um, it turns out that both the, the Freemasons in Alexandria were wrong and the Freemasons in Pennsylvania were wrong. Next slide. So, um, can you go back a slide? Can you go forward too? Uh, no, for, forward. One more. Okay, yeah, back one. So it turns out, so 1799, Washington died. In 1800, they made an estate inventory of all his belongings, and they, there was mention of a box containing an apron. It didn't say which one. In 1802, Martha Washington died, and there was a public auction. His wife, George Washington's wife, was Martha. After she died, there was a public auction, and the Lafayette apron, fortunately, somebody took notes, and it was sold for $6, and it was sold to this man. This is his silhouette, Captain Thomas Hammond who was married to Mildred Washington, the daughter of Charles Washington. Remember, Charles Washington founded Charlestown where the cave is, right? And so, um, and lived at Happy Retreat, which is two miles from the cave. So these two, um, this Washington, the daughter of Charles Washington, he bought the apron and they brought it out to Charlestown. Next slide. Now, there was kind of funny, it's like a Charlie Chaplin movie because when this is Lafayette as an older man, he came back to America in uh, 1825, right? And he went to the lodge in Alexandria and they showed him the apron, the wrong one, and he said, yes, that's the apron I gave Washington 40 years before, but that's because they look so similar. We can kind of forgive him for that. Um, the, the other, uh, you know, this, the other one, that, the one that looks so much like it, was bought by another family relative of Washington and was eventually donated. We were able to track who it was sold to and eventually donated to. Next slide. Then in 1844, this is nearly 20 years before the Civil War, there's this article in a long out of, pub, out of publication uh, journal called the Freemasons Monthly Journal, and it describes the 90th anniversary of the cave's Masonic use. So the story is that it was in 1754 when the cave was first used as a Masonic lodge. So now in 1844, all the Freemasons in the local area got together, we're gonna have a big feast and a big party and there's gonna be, of course, a long speech, right? How can we not have a long speech? Next slide. This is the man who gave the long speech, 80 minutes. He started talking about the cave and how it was associated with George Washington. And in his speech, he mentions that he actually holds up the apron and says, this is the apron that was given to George Washington by the Marquis de Lafayette as a gift of the Grand Lodge of France. So that's where we first learned that this wasn't just, it was actually a gift from the Grand Lodge of France. Um, and then, um, they, the, the journalists who were there tried to get a copy of that speech from Faulkner, the guy who gave it, but they never were able to. And I've searched through a lot of different libraries looking for that speech and I haven't found it, um, which is really too bad because he probably would have had some more 80 minutes talking about the cave. Next speech, next slide. But that man, Faulkner, has very close ties to George Washington's associates as well. So this is George Washington, this is Patrick Henry, and this is a man named Edmund Pendleton, who was like the governor of Virginia during the Revolutionary War, a leading Freemason as well. And Philip Clayton Pendleton was a close associate of Faulkner, the guy who gave this long speech about the cave. And he was the son of Phil Colonel Philip Pendleton, who was a very close associate of George Washington. We see that um, before the war, he spent like a month and a half spending Christmas at George Washington's home. 
right? So a very close relative, a f close friend. And what we see is that Philip Pendleton also owned land right next to the cave and, and George Washington's bullskin farm. And also one of his brothers was actually in the Beeline March that we looked at, that, that where the leader was one of the owners of the cave, right? Um, and this Philip Clayton Pendleton sister was the mother of Andrew Kennedy. He was the man who married the forgotten godson's daughter, the man who bought the cave farm. So all of these pieces like fit together. Um, and Walkner, uh, Faulkner's wife was also a half-sister of Philip Clayton Pendleton. So all of these people, like I said, it all kind of intertwines. Next slide. And George Washington Hammond, who was the son of Thomas Hammond, the guy who bought the Lafayette apron at the, uh, at the auction, he uh, inherited Happy Retreat when his father died. He also inherited the Lafayette apron, and then he donated the apron to the Mount Nebo Lodge, which is in Shepherdstown. That's um, I showed you Shepherdstown is very close to Charlestown. That's where that <clears throat> the apron is now. Next slide. And they called it the lost apron for a while because nobody knew where this real apron was, even though it had been you know, hanging on the wall in Mount Nebo's lodge for 170 years. But as we look through that lodge's minutes and records, we see that the apron was brought out in 1847 when the Smithsonian was um, dedicated. It was brought out in 1848 when the Washington Monument was dedicated, same apron. Um, in 1892, the Grand Lodge of Minnesota built a wood frame to kind of keep it in better shape. And then it was brought out in 1899 on the 100th anniversary of George Washington's death. It was brought to Mount Vernon. And then finally in 2009, Mark Tabert from the uh, memorial and also experts at Mount Vernon finally established that this really is Lafayette's apron, the real one. And now ever since 2011, on George Washington's birthday, that apron leaves West Virginia, goes all the way over the mountains and goes to Mount Vernon um, to be on display so people can enjoy it during President's Day and George Washington's birthday. Um, next slide. So in summary, there, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence all pointing in the same direction. None of it contradicts the history that George Washington went to the cave first in 1748 and then could have been using it for Masonic meetings during the war in 1754. And we also have direct primary evidence that George Washington went into the cave and it was a place of importance to him. The connection between the cave and the apron is not just that it was brought out and displayed at the cave, it was. But really the connection is like all of these associates, these, these people who were closely associated or even married into Washington's family, all knew about this. It supports the notion that this isn't some random hoax. There's probably a portion of this story that's true. Personally, I think that maybe the, the signature is not really George Washington's signature. I think it's more likely that somebody came back maybe in 1754, maybe George Washington came back in 1754 and said, yeah, I was here when I was younger and I'm gonna, yep. Yeah. Or somebody else, he told it to him, and I don't know who really marked the cave, right? But I am pretty convinced by all of this research that I've uncovered, which has pretty much been ignored by historians or anybody, uh, it just, there's too much here for it to be just a complete hoax. Um, and the reason I came all the way from America to talk to you nice folks is because I really think this cave needs cleaning up and preserving and more research. Just within the last couple of weeks, I found that there's another cave very close by within 10 miles that ha also has Masonic carvings and dates from the 1750s in the same area. So it's possible that more caves were used. We just don't, you know, so we're still doing research on that. So, you know, if, uh, more than happy to answer any questions. Be, you know, everybody, I'll, I'll give you, sir, a copy of the book as well. And, yes, yes. 
Yeah, this is just one little bit of the book. Yeah, it, it's, it's super yeah, it took me. Yeah, the book. I wanted the. I wanted to put all of my evidence into the book, mm -hmm. but I also wanted to tell the history so it made sense um, because a lot of people have forgotten the history of Freemasonry and the American Revolution and how. So I really wanted to organize it in a way that would be very readable as well. Um, unfortunately, what that means is a very long, heavy book. And in 2022, not many people read or even buy big, long, heavy books. So, <laughs> but J Jason, thank you very much. And I wanted to tell you something related and interesting. We were, my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Lochi and myself, we went to a, a, a conference on the history of Freemasonry in, in, in Spain, well, organized by the Center of the History of Freemasonry in Spain. And the last, they had a surprise for us one day, and they took us to what they, a former they call Beatario. It was a place, a catacomb, a cave, where the Beatas, you know, these women who were not nuns, but they were living as nuns all together. And it turns out that they found on a cave Masonic symbolism. I can show you the pictures. And it is very similar because the, there is an individual, uh, a gentleman who gave us a tour, who actually went because he was underwater. He's, uh, uh, he was diving and sometimes underwater. And we found, I mean, Masonic evidence. And so, and it's during the period. So it's not that. Uh, this is from 18th, uh, the 18th century. So it is not that uh, in this side of the Atlantic also there were people meeting in caves, masons. So it's not that, that it, so it's, there is also. There, there's a long history of Freemasons using caves. And I, and I, I document, and even the allegory of Freemasonry contains a lot of reference to caves and being brought to light itself, the title of my book, um, you know, they, there are caves in Scotland, there are caves in France, there are caves that have been used, there are still caves today that are being used by Freemasons for their meetings. So this is a long tradition. I don't think this is just one cave. I think that um, it, uh, it, um, if, if you look at the, interestingly, the entrance to this cave is like an angle <laughs> so it's almost like it spoke out to them like hey this is a great cave to be to be used as a masonic cave it even has an angle to it um and in the book i get into how even the orientation of the cave is set up remember i'm not a freemason so i'm not an expert but it's set up so there is a side chamber where an initiate can be sort of be prepared and then there's the main lodge that has the entrance on the right side and the you know it's set up as such excellent but thank you any questions uh, no merci 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 je préfère ne pas être filmé merci uh, uh, do you want to see some as we call cave here in the grand Orient? i can show you some and there are many caves uh, uh, used for freemasonry meetings even in Israel, because uh, we, we, we like to understand that we start from the depth of the earth and then go to the light like uh, uh, the allegory of the cavern de plateau. Uh, uh, it's a, about the same. So I'll show you some right now. If you I want. would love to see that. That would be my pleasure, All right. my honor. All right. <laughs> and uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, this cave uh, was discovered when uh, Washington was 17 years old, as I recall. That's what you said. Well, I don't think it was discovered when Washington, I think when he was 16, I think he went there. And there were already people living on, and in the book, I, I, did, I just didn't have enough time to put everything in here. But there was already people living on that property when he first went out there. and. I, when I went there, I saw what looked like Indian burial, like an Indian burial mound outside the cave. And so I suspect that even long before the white men came there, that Native Americans or American Indians were using the cave, they knew about it. This is probably something that, and George Washington had, even though he fought 
Native Americans or Indians in the war. He also had many Indians who were friends, too, and fought with him. And so it's possible that he learned about the cave or his associates learned about the cave from the original Americans. So I, I don't know if we can say it was discovered then. I, I, I would just say, and it's not a big cave. It's a very, it's a, um, you know, it's a very easy to get into cave. And so it's not difficult. It's, you know, you can walk in. You don't, I, you know, I've never been into a cave until this one, right? So you don't need a hard hat. You don't need all the gear. It's very easy. It's very convenient. There, in the book, you'll see there are even rocks where plenty of people can sit down. You know, I've had some doubters. So I've had, and I, I'm a very skeptical person myself, so I'm trying to figure out what's real and what's not real, what's true and what's legend. But I've had um, a Freemason tell me, oh, the cave would be too small, they never would have had ceremonies in there. But first of all, he never, that person never even went in the cave. It's bigger than this room, right? And also, maybe the ceremonies in 1754 were very different than they are now and it was probably maybe a much smaller group. George Washington's lodge, there were only six men when he was initiated as Freemason. So how big of a room do you need? Yeah, I, so another history, I take, I take so much pride in this. I hope you can see, I'm very enthusiastic about my topic. Just recently, I gave a book, copy of my book to somebody who gave it to a Harvard historian and then I heard back just recently, within the last couple of weeks, the historian said, I read your book, and I've come to the conclusion that George Washington never even stepped inside the cave. And I'm like, but we have a letter in George Washington's own handwriting that says he was. He even gives us the vectors, how many miles, the location, the size, the water. How can you say he never stepped inside the cave? I'm never going to get like CCTV footage of George Washington carving his name, right? But that letter is real. It's in the National Archives. I'm the, I'm the person who found it just by simply going into their uh, search engine typing cave. <laughs> and then boom, there's a letter, George Washington, because you know, all of his letters have been you know, um, you know, transcribed and put into the da database. Nobody had realized, like, oh, wow. So yes, Washington actually did go inside this cave it was a place that was very important to him. It's very sad, the condition. You saw all of the garbage and junk, and it's very sad. Thank you very much. What you said that um, the place is obviously large enough. Oh, yeah. okay. uh, it's obvious to me that uh, from what you've been talking about, what, what you just described, that the cave is obviously large enough to hold a meeting because meetings vary in size or whatever you have. And in those days, uh, 1754, you say? Yeah. Uh, back then, there was only, in England, the only uh, Grand Lodge that could influence Americans was the what we call the Modern's Grand Lodge or the English Grand Lodge. And they had a philosophy of uh, intellectual study and, and talking and discoursing and talking about geometry and architecture and all these kind of things and other things like that. They didn't have necessarily have regular meetings as such. So from what you're saying, it was obviously large enough to have a Masonic Lodge in those days. Um, the only other question I have on that is I'm not really totally familiar with the climate there in uh, Virginia. Uh, would you be able to have a crowd of maybe 10, 12? people in a confined space like that? Uh, I mean, what was the, what was the air like? I mean, was inside the cave, inside yeah. The cave? So, so, so a few things is remember that back in 1754, this was the frontier. There were no buildings, there were no taverns to hold lodges in. They're not gonna do it just out in the open where you have the elements, you have maybe even gonna be attacked by the Native Americans you know, you really want to have some place maybe kind of quiet and secure. And so the summers can be very hot. In fact, um, you know, the, the year 1754, when it, you may have come in, you may have missed this part, but that's when they were right there traveling through. It was in the summertime. So it was probably in Fahrenheit, you know, 90 degrees, something like that, 80s, 90s, very humid. Um, 
but when you go inside the cave, it's the same temperature all year round. The air is fresh, um, and it's, you know, no one's going to bump their head. It's easy to walk in um, to the main, the main room where there's natural seating. Um, and, you know, some caves can have like poisonous gases in them, but not this cave. It's very fresh, it's a small cave. So it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's actually ideal f for, for those times as far as a safe place to meet. Um, it's very well hidden as well. If you go, if, you, if we went back to maybe just back a few slides, it's about 100 feet from the side of a road. Uh, go back until, okay, good. So this is a road right here, right? And it's called Old Cave Road. And people drive on Old Cave Road all day long. You know, it's not a busy road, but people are, they can't even see the cave. And they don't even really, they, they've heard, the locals have heard that, yeah, there's a cave, it's called Old Cave Road, something about George Washington, maybe something about the Freemasons. But you can't even see it. It's very well hidden until you come like really close to it you still can't even see the opening of the, of the cavern. It's until the next slide that you, uh, you're, until you're like right on it, then you realize that, oh, there's actually a hole going into the cave. Um, so it's really well hidden, uh, easy to access, cool, perfect climate to have meetings. Um, and, you know, there's, in, in, in my book, um, most of George Washington's associates at the time were Scottish. And, um, you know, his lodge eventually was chartered under the Grand Lodge of Scotland. In, in not, the, not the cave, but I'm saying it, his Fredericksburg Lodge. And most of it, he had many Scottish associates throughout his lifetime who were Freemasons. Most of his friends were Scottish, Scotch, Scottish. And interestingly, in one of George Washington's letters, there, there's, there's a, I think many people try to prove that George Washington didn't take Freemasonry, Freemasonry that seriously, that it wasn't that important to him. And in one of the letters that he wrote, um, he, he mentioned that, well, I haven't been in an English Masonic Lodge in many, many years. But I think George Washington was specifically saying English Lodge because he really was in American lodges or Scottish lodges when he was growing up. And so, and he even, one of his, uh, w one of his really closest uh, confidants at the, at the cave, another Freemason, even referred to what I think is the cave as our, the, the Scottish court, okay? And it's clearly he's talking about what turned into the Winchester Masonic Lodge and he called it the Scottish court, which is an interesting term because I think even within the Scottish Rite, which obviously is different than Scottish Freemasonry, but there still are some connections between Scottish Rite. It's, it, but um, uh, through France, there are definitely some connect, you know, possible connections with Scottish Freemasonry. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that they were even referring to the Masonic Lodge out on the American frontier as the Scottish court. Um, just an interesting curiosity. It's something that I've wondered about because I know that within the Scottish Rite, they actually later on, decades later, they started using the word court for some of their own um, organizations and, and titles. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for the All audience. Right. Thank you.